Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Garrett. Uh, I am Dean of the Australian School of Business at the University of New South Wales in Australia. Um, in, in the US, business schools tend to be small, boutique MBA factories in Australia. They're industrial scale operations. I have 15,000 students in our business school. Um, it's, it's an enormous pleasure for me to be here this afternoon, not only in this beautiful building, but also right next door to the University of California DC Center, where 30 students from the US Study Center are currently studying. As I used to say to them when I tried to convince them to come, while your friends are uh, tanning themselves in the beach in Sydney, you can be freezing your ass off in uh, Washington, which is exactly what they're doing today, and I think loving it. Um, this is normally the graveyard shift in any, uh, in any conference, but this afternoon we've got not only a juicy subject matter, but an incredibly talented panel. So I'd like to try to get out of the way as quickly as possible. Let me just set the scene uh, with a couple of observations. The first one is that if you're talking knowledge, economy and innovation, Australia and the US, there's a lot of uh, feel-good stories out there. I think all Australians know that Australians tend to be overrepresented in the most innovative parts of the United States, Silicon Valley, Hollywood and Wall Street. Um, it's also true that American innovation is adding massive value to the Australian economy at the moment. Not only, I think Alan Gingell mentioned companies like Chevron and the extraordinary investments and technology investments they're making in the mining sector, but also companies like GE and IBM really adding to the knowledge economy down under. Um, but there are some challenges on the table, uh, challenges that I'm sure our panellists uh, will be more than happy to rise to. Big question in Australia is what happens after the mining boom? Everyone says that Australia is a smart country, but it's been a lucky country, better endowed in natural resources than almost anywhere else on earth for 100 years. Can it really transition from being a lucky country into a smart country? In the US, the US obviously has been the world's leader in innovation for 100 years, certainly 50 years, maybe 100 years, but is that really coming to an end? Can you base an entire economy on 20-something Facebook billionaires who don't employ very many people? Uh, if the US is coming back as a manufacturing power, is it doing it because of innovation or is it be doing it, doing it because labor costs are low and energy is really cheap in the United States? Um, these, are, these are big questions. Above all, of course, I think this has also been mentioned, one perennial challenge with, with the knowledge economy is where are the jobs? Uh, does it really help us after the financial crisis if corporations have learnt they can do more with less? That is, they can be more productive with fewer employees. Big challenges on the table for the Australian economy, the US economy where knowledge is concerned. What have we got as a panel? Well. Um, at the far right, certainly geographically today, I don't think ideologically, is Australian Communications <laughs> Minister Malcolm Turnbull. <laughs> it's all relative, of course, Malcolm, I think. Um, uh, Malcolm has enormous responsibilities in the Australian government at the moment, not least of which is trying to roll out while lowering the costs of something called the National Broadband Network, a pretty ambitious plan set in place by the former Labor government to do either fibre to the home or fibre to the node for 97 plus percent of Australian households. Pretty tough when a lot of those people live a very long way from any metropolitan area. Um, of course, Malcolm, as many of you know, has a very distinguished career before entering politics. Among other things, I was thinking when it comes to knowledge economy, uh, being a very successful internet, internet entrepreneur and uh, creating and then selling a, a company called Aussie Mail. I thought a very clever name for a, an email company in Australia uh, more than a decade ago. And he also was the head of Goldman Sachs in Australia. Um, at a personal level, Malcolm and his wife Lucy, who's with us today, have been incredibly uh, wonderful supporters, both of the US Study Centre and of me, of me personally, since I returned to Australia in 2008. And I don't think I've had a chance to thank Malcolm publicly for allowing my daughter to interview him on uh, privacy and national security matters 
because not only is Edward Snowden in the news, but Malcolm represented a guy called Peter Wright a long time ago in Australia when the British government was trying to uh, constrain the publication of a book called Spycatcher. So Malcolm, thanks very much for being with us. Um, jumping over one seat, Robert Thompson uh, is currently the CEO of News Corp. Uh, he's previously managing editor of the Wall Street Journal. Before that, he was editor of the Times in London. Um, I've certainly benefited enormously from listening to Robert and asking Robert questions in visits that Malcolm Binks, the chairman of the US Study Center, and I have taken to New York. And of course, I always love seeing Robert because I'm of an age where somebody who looks like a tall version of Elvis Costello is always a wonderfully edifying experience for me. I don't know Jason Furman personally, but by God, he's got a fantastic a pedigree. Um, I was saying to him in the waiting room that uh, Harvard economists have, uh, have been chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors for the president often. Uh, I think the first one was Paul Samuelson, uh, maybe, maybe not, but uh, also um, Jason's PhD advisor, Greg Mankiw, held that office. And of course, Jason has been involved in, in politics, uh, economics and politics in the US since before he was born, it seems, from his CV, um, working in the council, staffing the council in the Clinton administration and then uh, being an economic advisor for Barack Obama since the very beginning, which I presume was probably about 2006 or something like that. Um, so it's fantastic to have the chairman of the, of the CEA with us. Last but certainly not least, uh, you probably can't tell at the moment why I might introduce John Daly as Hopalong. Uh, John is the CEO of the Grattan Institute in Australia, Australia's leading uh, think tank, which really holds government to account by doing fact-based analytic work on all public policy issues. Um, John is the founding CEO of the Grattan Institute. He happened to have an accident, uh, tough life as it is, in Aspen recently. So there are some crutches somewhere near the stage. Um, I, uh, we've agreed in advance that with a talented panel like this, what I need to do is get out of the way and let them do their stuff. Malcolm Turnbull is going to speak first. I think we're going to go across this way. Malcolm first, Jason second. Robert will follow up with whatever's on his mind, and then I've asked John to do, if any more provo provocation is required, to add some more provocative thoughts, and I hope then we can integrate all of you into what I'm sure will be an extraordinarily fascinating, edifying, and entertaining last panel of the day. Malcolm Turnbull. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff, and can I just say how uh, honoured I am to be invited to speak here today the CSIS, this great uh, forum organised with the US Studies Centre, which, as you heard earlier, Jeff was the inaugural uh, director, and of course Bates Gill, its uh, current director, is, is here today, and of course has, has with CSIS, organised this. Um, it's a very distinguished room. I learnt long ago that you should be very careful about making acknowledgements, because the people you acknowledge accept it as their due. The one you overlook bears you a grudge for the rest of their life. Uh, nonetheless, nonetheless, we do have some very uh, distinguished people here. Uh, Jeff Bleich, the former American ambassador in Australia, and, and he and Becky still very much missed. Uh, of course, my uh, former colleagues, Robert Hill and Brendan Nelson, uh, uh, former defence ministers, no less. Uh, and of course, Kim Beasley, another former defence minister, and currently the uh, Australian ambassador in Washington is here too. And that, with that, I will just... Uh, say in the words of a great Australian sportsman, I love yous all. Uh, <laughs> now, I'm going, to talk, I'm going to talk to you about the internet and uh, in particular some of the issues we face in Australia, but the issues we face globally. But let me paint the big picture. Throughout all of our lives, except those that are extremely young, there has been a competition and a limited supply of platforms. Initially, there were newspapers, then a handful of licensed television stations and radio stations, then cable television or pay television, and so forth. But these were all platforms, both for the delivery of content and, above all, for the delivery of the lifeblood of that content, advertising. And then along came the internet. And the internet is, in reality, the uber platform. 
the Uber platform that overwhelms all of the rest. And as its functionality and capacity has improved, its threat to the rest of those platforms gets greater and greater. Uh, Robert, obviously, is running what is in large part a newspaper company, and he knows very well, we were looking at some slides earlier, and he was uh, complaining that there was one flipping up on my iPad, that uh, showed, for example, that right now in the United States, uh, all advertising revenues, online has 42.6%, print, all of print has 7.7%. Think about it. I remember many years ago um, uh, getting an offer from uh, Bob Maxwell, no less, in the Suite Imperiale of the Ritz Hotel in Paris, for $850 million for the Melbourne Age. I don't think, I'm trying to think, is it worth 10% <laughs> of that today? Uh, probably not, probably not even that much. Um, but uh, even television has fallen behind online. And of course, that, that uh, domination of the one hyper platform, the Uber platform, is set to continue in large part because of these. The domination of smartphones, the revolution, as we were hearing earlier today, of the fact that in this country, 62% of Americans have access to a smartphone. In Australia, it's 84%. Uh, and the reality is that of the wealthiest 20% of the people in the world, 83% uh, are online mostly with smartphones as well as other devices. The bottom 20%, encouragingly, it's 17%. And these numbers are moving rapidly. So we are closely approaching a world in which most people, almost all the rich, and increasingly a large percentage of, and before too long, a plurality, or most of the poor, most of the poor, will have access 24-7 to the same platform, to the same platform, with devices that are getting cheaper and cheaper, that have the power of what we would have called a decade or so ago a supercomputer. Now, this has been incredibly disruptive. Uh, Robert's chairman, Rupert Murdoch, said uh, in the late 90s that the internet will destroy more profitable businesses than it will create. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's right or not. He might have just been going through a gloomy moment. But it has certainly destroyed a lot of profitable businesses. It has also dramatically changed almost every aspect of national security. When we think about a world in which everything is connected, an internet of things, where every machine is connected to the internet in one form or another, Obviously, the power of that, I mean, look at something, look at something like Waze, look at the application Waze. How extraordinary. Think of the efforts that governments used to go to to try to work out traffic problems. You know, how, where, are, where are the traffic blockages? Cameras were installed on highways, all sorts of elaborate reporting mechanisms. Simply by having enough people with a smartphone, uh, you know you have hundreds of people on a particular highway. You know what the speed of the traffic is every single second. All of, all of these technologies are coming out and applications are coming out of these devices. But in terms of national security, that vulnerability is formidable. I spoke last night briefly at the embassy about the Snowden affair and the, the implications of that. Uh, the fact that one person could take away so many, it's been reported 1.8 million files, a massive amount of data is a complete transformation. It's no longer the case of the, you know, dishonest clerk in the embassy sneaking into the ambassador's office and photographing a couple of cables. We're now talking about the ability to access massive amounts of data. And before that, of course, there was private manning. And then there's been another paradigm shift too caused by the combination of digitization and the internet, the ability to disseminate vast amounts of information globally, instantly. In, in the past, if a 
country, a corporation, uh, an agency discovered that it was being hacked into, uh, that perhaps that there was a backdoor in one of their systems that exposed a vulnerability, they may very well close that backdoor. They may not. They may leave it open. It may be quite interesting to find out who puts their head into that back door and you might want to let something out of that back door. There are all sorts of things that you could do, but the one thing you wouldn't do is tell the world. The reality we now face is that not only is so much data being stored because storage has become so cheap that it's not free, but its cost is de minimis nowadays, and not only it has, as a consequence of processing power, become so great, we can manage and manipulate that data. Some of the, some of, uh, the, uh, some of us that have been uh, involved with or associated with intelligence gathering in years past recall how, whether it was police or intelligence agencies, had to be very judicious about which wires they tapped. Who did they listen into? If only because of resources. There's a limit to how many telephone calls you can monitor and record and transcribe. If you're in a position to record everything and store it forever, uh, that is an extraordinary capacity, but it also creates a vulnerability. And then the consequence of that material being made public is very different. There is a gigantic difference between the head of a government discovering that another government has been intercepting some of his telecommunications and countermeasures would obviously be taken. Uh, discovering that in the way it would have been in the case in the past and then reading about it in one of Robert's newspapers or one of his competitors' newspapers and emblazoned all over the internet whereupon a political response is required. And this also raises big political issues for us, of course, in Australia, as we've seen most recently with Indonesia, uh, you know, notoriously. But it also raises very big commercial issues for the United States. Uh, the decline, very significant declines in sales by American technology companies in the last quarter in China. Uh, the, the NSA uh, leaks, the Snowden revelations, have a, will be used and are being used against American corporations very, very actively by their competitors in the world outside the United States and its closest allies, which, by the way, is where almost all of their future, um, future customers are to be found. The implications, too, of the internet for government are formidable. And I have to say, uh, poorly exploited by and large to date in Australia. Uh, many countries, including the United States, have done a much better job at making government data sets available. We have a handful of uh, government data available online uh, with an open invitation to developers to you know, uh, build their own applications. Um, I think Todd Park, who I met with this week, uh, obviously has done an outstanding job in health and will do more as the US government's uh, CTO. Uh, the Danes have done an outstanding job. The British are doing very well. This is a very key focus for us as a new government uh, to ensure that we get the benefit of that combination of gathering vast amounts of data, as governments do, putting them into machine-readable form and then making them uh, openly available. Um, we've seen some examples of it. Obviously, you know, one of the great examples, of course, is, is with mass transit. You know, if you talk to a transport economist a decade ago, he or she would have said to you that mass transit only, is only effective uh, if the frequency of the running is only really effective if the frequency of the running is such that you don't have to look at a timetable to turn up. You know, if you've got people have got to look at elaborate timetables, it's all too hard. But with uh, a live running uh, data being streamed online, being available to uh, application developers, any of us can look at our smartphone and see that the 10 past 10 train is actually arriving at 10.17, that's fine. 
have another coffee, make another phone call, have a more leisurely stroll to the station, it enables a much more effective use of mass transit. And of course, there are so many applications. Um, I just should say a little bit about uh, the Australia and the National Broadband Network, because I know the Australians will be very familiar with it, the Americans won't be. And I'll be, I will give, this is a spin-free, non-partisan account. Um, everywhere else in the world, except for Australia, the standard approach to upgrading broadband services has been for the private sector to do it, and for governments to apply judicious subsidies to make up for those areas that are uneconomic. You know, regional areas, economically deprived areas, remote areas, and so forth. And the virtue of that is government is up for a, a sum certain that makes a political decision and writes a cheque, and the business and execution risk is with the private sector. The profound mistake that our predecessors made was that they decided to build a national broadband network, which is in fact a last mile network, so from what you'd call the central office to the customer's premises, um, the, to, do, to do it themselves and for the government to do it, and to do it as fibre to the premises for 93% of the population. Uh, this meant that all of the business risk, all of the ex execution risk, and the two are different, you know, one thing is the cost of building it, and then of course, even if you've built it, and even if you've built it within your cost for uh, a budget, then the question is, is it gonna generate the revenues? Uh, but that execution and business risk all lies with the government. And we are the only country in the world to have done that, and it's an ex extraordinary mistake. Uh, having said that, as I've said to many of you before, um, I am like the guy who gets lost driving around in Ireland, walks into a pub, asks for directions to Dublin, only to be told, if I were you, sir, I wouldn't be starting from here. Uh, so the challenge for us is what to do about it. Uh, what we've, our policy, our commitment is to complete the network but to do so in a more cost-effective way. Now, one of the good things that's happened in recent years is that technology, as usual, has come to the rescue. And there are a whole range of last-mile technologies that enable you to deliver very high-speed broadband, and I'm talking 50 megs, 100 megs and higher, without having to take a fibre optic cable into the customer's premises, typically by using the last few hundred metres of copper from telephone company or the, high, or the coax from a uh, cable TV network. And these technologies are being deployed here. You've seen what AT&T has done with Uverse. You've seen what all the cable companies have done here with Doxus. So our commitment is to complete the network and do so sooner and cheaper. And if you're really interested in this subject, uh, and if not constrained, I can bore for the world on this topic, I'd encourage you to read the strategic review which the NBN Co has recently published, which is on their website. Um, the, the problem is it's still going to be hugely expensive, and I think the government will end up spending, will end up spending about $20 billion more than we ought to have done had it been undertaken in a more rational way. And that's better than spending an extra 50 or $60 billion, which is what would have happened if the previous policy had been continued. Now, the good news about it, about having a national broadband network, however, uh, and it doesn't have to be government-owned, and as you can do it, the private sector can do it and does do it in many countries, is that you have a single wholesale platform. So you don't get those problems of vertical integration where the retail telco owns the carriage service and with all of the issues, uh, competition issues that arise from that. So on that note, I'll conclude and look forward to the discussion that follows. Thank you. Thanks very much, Malcolm. Uh, Jason Furman. Uh, thanks so much, and it is uh, terrific to be here. I don't see any um, American former uh, defense secretaries, but if there are, apologies for not acknowledging you. Um, <laughs> but want to really um, come back to a lot of what Malcolm talked about in terms of the role that technology and innovation plays in the economy. But before I get there, I wanted to step back and just talk about how we actually judge the economy and what we're trying to achieve and what our goal is, and then talk about the role that technology 
and some of the other big trends are playing in that goal. If you only let me see one statistic about the economy, the one I'd want to look at is median family income. Because that tells you something about how the overall economy is doing, and it tells you how those gains are translating down to the typical household. And if you look at the last couple decades, that uh, median family statistic has been one of the more sobering ones in our economy. The typical family's income now is lower than it was in 1997, and that's a combination of structural trends and then a deep recession layered on top of that. And wages have only risen by a small amount since the 1970s. If you allowed me to look at two more economic statistics, you let me look at two more, I'd then want to look at the two statistics that lead you to that typical family's income. And one of that is how is the aggregate economy doing, which you could look at in terms of GDP or some, um, something that leads to GDP, like productivity. And then some measure of inequality, which tells you where those gains are going. And if you drill down, you discover that that phenomenon in terms of the typical family's income is basically about half because we've seen some slowdown in our growth rate in the last several decades, and about half because we've seen a very large increase in inequality over the last several decades, so that not all of that growth is translating to the typical family. And so I think our challenge going forward is, um, first of all, to return the economy to its full potential. And the economy is healing. The unemployment rate is coming down. We're getting back there. But once we get beyond that, it's to understand what we can do to expand our potential and to understand what we can do to make sure more people share in that potential. And technology and innovation and education plays an important role um, in both of those stories. And it can play, done the right way, an important role for the better, and done the wrong way, um, an important role that, in some sense, could create um, some problems and challenge, uh, some additional challenges. So to talk about the innovation side of it first, if you look from 1948 to 2012, you look at a worker in 2012, they could produce five times more per hour as their counterpart in 1948. The country vastly richer, vastly more productive than it was before. You drill down and ask why that is, and you can use something called growth accounting, which breaks your growth down into three components. And it turns out of that growth, 9% of it is because of what uh, might be called the quality of labor, education, training, all those types of factors. 37% of that increase from 1948 through 2012 is that workers in 2012 have a lot more capital at their disposal because we've had decades of investment. 54% of that improvement, 54% of the reason why that worker in 2012 can make so much more than that worker in 1948 is that we've expanded total, what economists call total factor productivity. That's the total amount that you can squeeze out of a given amount of capital and labor. Total factor productivity is a new invention. It's a new process for managing your inventories. It's when the United States enters a free trade agreement with Australia or does um, a trade agreement with the Pacific that expands the scale of our markets. That will also show up as total factor productivity growth. All of these things um, are what show up as that, and that's ultimately the most important determinant. Um, if you drill down, though, and look at the time periods, 1948 to 1973, total factor productivity growth was 2.2% a year. From 1973 to 1987, it slowed to 0.5% a year. In that year, Robert Solo, who's a famous economist who had worked at the Council of Economic Advisors under President Kennedy, wrote an article in which he says um, that you see the computer age everywhere except in the productivity statistics. 
since he wrote that very pessimistic assessment, things have gotten a decent amount better. And that total factor of productivity growth has doubled to 1% a year. And that's, I think, because of a lot of the things Malcolm has been talking about in terms of the internet, applications, mobile devices, and all of that spread out over the last couple decades. But even with all of that, we're still not at the productivity growth rates that we were in the 1950s and 1960s. And in part, that's because we're not benefiting from a lot of the pent-up investments we made in World War II and things like jet engines that had civilian applications in the 50s and 60s, part because we're not making public investments at the scale we were then, like the interstate highway system. There's a real debate in economics as to whether even that 1% can continue. There's pessimists like the economist Robert Gordon at Northwestern who thinks that we're basically running out of ideas and doesn't think we can persist that growth rate and we're going to see some type of stagnation. There's others, and there's a good new book by Eric Bjorn Lufsen, and whose name I can never pronounce, um, who argue just the opposite. I tend to be more on the side of the second rather than the former, I think just because an economist can't figure out what inventions are going to dis define productivity growth five years from now doesn't mean that somebody else isn't going to figure it out, and they consistently have, and it's hard to predict innovation because it's by its inherent nature unpredictable and I think we have a lot of the infrastructure especially that technological infrastructure to foster that innovation but I don't think we should take it for granted it's not just ideas it also it, it, and it's not just a knowledge infrastructure it also is an actual um, physical infrastructure and here as Malcolm said the United States has taken the approach of really a private sector led investment in that infrastructure. And if you look at the telecom, just the two leading telecom companies, they invest more than the top five oil and gas companies. They invest four times more than the big three automakers. Their investments in wireless in the last five years have been up 40%, while those investments have been flat in Europe. The United States is leading in 4G. And all of this creates an ecosystem in which operating systems, apps, the design of devices, all is centered here in the United States. The reason that's happened is a credit and a tribute to the private sector in our economy, but public policy has played a role. The research and development tax credit gives an incentive for some of that innovation. The bonus depreciation and expensing that we've had in this country as a tool to fight the recession also encourage and incentivize companies to invest more and then a regulatory approach to a range of issues, whether it's privacy, cybersecurity, or an open internet, that establishes a light touch, a multi-stakeholder approach, but a basic set of rules that give consumers and companies the certainty they need to make those types of investments and those types of innovations have played an important role as well, and I expect they'll continue to do so. If you um, I think this technology is one of the three important trends that is supporting the US economy now. The second one that I'd list up there is also related to innovation. And there it's the innovation in terms of how we extract oil and gas from shale. And as a result of that, the United States has now become the largest producer of oil and gas in the world. We've surpassed Saudi Arabia, and we've well surpassed um, I, 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 we've surpassed Russia and well surpassed Saudi Arabia. We now, for the first time in a long time, are producing more oil than we import. And that's not just production. That's also because of the all of the above energy strategy that has done things like more fuel efficient vehicles, more investments in renewables that have reduced our consumption at the same time. The energy boom is not just um, jobs in energy. It also is a big support for American manufacturing. It's encouraging companies to come back to the United States, to locate here. And it's a benefit to our national security and dealing with climate change as you shift from coal to cleaner fuels like natural gas. The third trend, and it's one where technology shows up as well, is healthcare. 
And this is one example of where technology can be double-edged. A lot of the um, extraordinary growth of health costs in this country and around the world have been associated with innovation and a set of incentives around innovation where innovation is about the best possible cure no matter what the cost, not taking into account um, cost. Recently, we've started to bend the curve on the growth in healthcare. And if you look at the last three years, it's the slowest growth in national health expenditures measured on a real per capita basis that we have seen in this country in the 50 years that we've been recording data. And Robert's newspaper was very kind to give me, I think about 1,200 words for an op-ed on this topic. And then it restrained itself to writing only a 500 word denunciation of me <laughs> in its editorial the very next day. Um, but even their editorial didn't dispute the dramatic slowdown in health costs. It debated the cause of it. And I would be more than happy to debate with any of your editorial writers that there's a lot of causes of that slowdown and certainly the Affordable Care Act is one of them. You don't need to agree on the causes though to agree that it means a lot for job creation, it means a lot for the ability to grow wages, and it means a lot for getting our deficit under control to having a slowing rate of growth in healthcare. So you look at all three of these, technology, energy, and health, I think they'll all help create jobs. I think they'll all help create better jobs. I think they'll all help raise wages. And then the question is, will those translate back into that statistic I started with, which is the typical family's income? And I think there's a lot of reason to hope that they will. Uh, Malcolm talked quite eloquently about the way in which everyone has access to essentially the same internet and with devices becoming cheaper, often with the same devices. That's not true um, everywhere, however. It's not true in our schools, for example, where the typical school in this country um, can have a broadband connection that's even slower than the one you have in your home, shared with hundreds of students. The next generation of education is going to rely on devices and innovations like the, um, like, uh, your, your, like um, your colleague and, and chairman, Rupert Murdoch, and Joel Klein are trying to do in terms of um, tablet computing, other devices that take advantage of internet connections that we don't have in schools today. And that's why it's so important that the president launched an initiative um, that we're calling Connect Ed and that the FCC is moving forward on to both incentivize investment in schools so they have higher speed connections, but also the devices we need, the equipment to run on those devices, and the training we need for teachers, a complementary effort around all of that. So you take technology and make the right changes to make sure it benefits everyone. Um, energy is obviously um, can play a role also in having incomes translate. And healthcare finally has been one of the things that's kept incomes and wages from growing as quickly as you'd like over the last several decades. So the slowdown of it will also help those gains translate back to the typical family. So in conclusion, I think we're at an exciting time um, for our economy. We've seen growth strengthen a lot at the end of 2013. I think there's a lot of cyclical factors that will benefit growth in the next couple of years, like the decline in fiscal drag, the fact that we continue to have potential in housing, the deleveraging of consumers. But we want to look past that, look out 5, 10, 20 years. And I think when you look out 5, 10, 20 years, what you see are a lot of iPads connected to the internet, a lot of um, a continued energy boom, and you know, hopefully a continued slower growth in the cost of health care. And I think the three of those um, can combine to have enormous potential for, for where we're going. Thanks very much, Jason. And uh, I'm so glad that uh, economics has moved on from endogenous growth theory and skill bias, technological change, and other things that no one ever understood to talk about things that uh, seem more intelligible to the non-economist in the non-economist in the room. Robert Thompson, you've already been baited a couple of times. Would you like to uh, take the bait, rise to the challenge, speak off the cuff? The floor is yours. Uh, all of the above. Uh, first of all, uh, to, to Jason, I'd like to say, so uh, you'll, you'll understand there's a deficit of 700 words that are coming your way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
to, to Malcolm's point about some of the upheaval going on in, in some uh, newspapers, thankfully not our own. Uh, if I were to um, greet and thank all the former editors of newspapers, uh, mm -hmm. there are an increasing number of ex-editors of newspapers, so that would take up most of my time. In, in fact, I'm a living, breathing contradiction of someone uh, who's rather ignorant as an individual um, meant to be talking to you about the knowledge economy. Uh, and uh, collectively, we've let you down. There's no PowerPoint here, so collectively we are powerless and pointless. Um, <laughs> But I would uh, like, uh, in fact, not to talk about the knowledge economy, which I think is uh, spoken of uh, a lot, uh, not to excess, but a lot, uh, and focus on uh, w what I like to call a knowing economy, uh, which is a level of uh, understanding and intuition on top of basic knowledge, which alone is not enough to do it, though it is essential to have it to do it. Uh, for example, in media, uh, there's no end of knowledge uh, among journalists, uh, editors, uh, and media executives. Uh, we're right all the time uh, about everything, uh, as Jason knows. So, uh, and, and Malcolm, too, uh, knows that the media is right all the time about everything. And yet, there has been an institutional implosion of media. What is it uh, that is the difference between having that extraordinarily accumulated knowledge uh, and failing to confront the reality of the digital change that Malcolm outlined. Uh, uh, because many uh, a newspaper uh, has met a dire digital fate. In this country, basically every paper from Boston uh, to LA uh, is for sale, and in between them, uh, most magazines are also for sale. And that's indicative of something that, I mean, we joke about it, uh, that we're in a, a transition from Gutenberg to Zuckerberg, but it's true. Uh, too many um, uh, traditional media types, uh, knowledgeable as they are, have retreated passively to pasture, um, uh, digitally dishevelled and, as always, being journalists, dissolute. So, I mean, it's, it goes without saying, and Malcolm highlighted it well, that two, uh, two of the profound trends of our time, the most profound trends, are digitisation and globalisation. And there's not much point uh, in s uh, struggling and swimming against uh, those powerful tides. Uh, but there's an extraordinary benefit to be derived from taking advantage of that uh, momentum. Now, I wouldn't uh, deify the digital, it's certainly important, uh, but we don't want to be um, subject to cyber servitude, because there's much discussion about the concept of big data. I mean, you hear about it all the time, big data. But in fact, big data can be a large mistake, um, because it's a metric of quantity, not necessarily a, a diviner of quality. Uh, and the other thing to remember, which is why so many knowledgeable uh, media types have struggled to confront contemporary circumstance, technology is often a template uh, or a canvas. Uh, it is not the thing itself. It's a platform. Uh, and for example, you can harvest data endlessly, but what is the difference between wheat and meaningful stuff? Uh, and of course, once you have data or a certain amount of knowledge, you need to really to know what to do with it within commercial and moral parameters. Uh, and uh, the Snowden uh, leaks, obviously the, the moral of, uh, around privacy is one of those uh, parameters, but there are various parameters that we need to contemplate and a little too profound for me to deal with here today. But the rate of change is e-exponential uh, in uh, communications and media. I was recently uh, at CES in Las Vegas, uh, and of course the fashion of the moment, literally the fashion of the moment, are wearables. Uh, and as they say, uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, and one would hope that some of those wearables do indeed stay in Vegas, <laughs> because the idea of oversized phones worn outside your suit, that's probably not a good, you know, fashion before comfort, um, as they say. Style before substance, at least I believe that. Um, uh, but, you know, chunky, very chunky watches, but clearly bracelets, actually I haven't noticed any at this table, so this is clearly not a trendy bunch of, of erudite people. Uh, the, the, um, <laughs> 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 telling you how much you did, didn't sleep, um, how much you, how far you did or didn't walk, uh, that, that sort of, I'm not going to name the brands because it'd be for advertising. And if you'd like to advertise a dear brand, you can pay for one in the uh, Wall Street <laughs> Journal. 
But uh, uh, you know uh, that sensors are going to play a, a, a more important role in our life. You also know that uh, chunky bracelets are probably not um, uh, the, the highest form of development in that sector. But the, the other areas, and uh, Malcolm alluded to a little bit, but just, you know, statistics, because you have to have them, uh, the number of photographs that were uploaded and shared digitally in 2006 were none. In 2013, about a billion a day. Uh, video per minute, uh, 2007, five hours. Uh, last year, per, per minute, uploaded 100 hours of video. That's a lot of video. Too much for any sensible person to watch. Smartphones, you know, it depends how you calculate it. There are about uh, five to six billion mobile phones at the moment. Uh, about 1.5 to 2 billion of those are smartphones. There'll be about, according to Tim Cook of Apple, there'll be about one and a half billion <laughs> smartphones sold this year. And the rate of growth in smartphone subscribers, which is a, a, a more uh, measurable statistic, uh, in India last year, 52%, uh, Mexico, 43%, Indonesia, 34%, Brazil, 28%, Taiwan, 60%, Russia, 38%. Uh, and in other countries, it was slower because the penetration rate is, is that much more sophisticated. So these are absolutely unprecedented trends of expansion. And so we know that, we have that knowledge, but that of itself won't get you there. These are extraordinary opportunities for the knowing, uh, and uh, so not just for the knowledgeable, and s definitely not uh, for the ignorant. The, uh, but it's, if it's not clear, uh, where you are, if you don't have an economic uh, a GPS, and if it isn't uh, a, an environment which is, for example, conducive to start starting a business, uh, then then people are not going to be able to take advantage of these opportunities. I mean, I, there's a lot of discussion, and there will be more in coming weeks uh, about the uh, the rise of robots, uh, the very difficult to pronounce, uh, not the apocalypse, but the job calypse. Uh, and in part, some of this debate uh, will be uh, prompted by a remake of Robocop. Uh, 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 and you have to distinguish between uh, movie hype and economic reality. Uh, and the thing to remember, because I was a, f a correspondent for five years in Japan from 1989 to 1994, just at the end of the bubble, just my luck, and, and the uh, beginning of the decades of decline. The famous Fanuc factory, uh, which is the robot factory that makes robots, was actually opened in 1981. <coughs> uh, but people still talk about that Fanuc factory. And so things haven't moved on in quite uh, the same way. And the jobs that are going to be created are, are, are going to be generally uh, in societies where uh, that bit of knowing, the orientation, is that much more sophisticated. And it's a personal level, societal level, and governmental level of uh, understanding. Uh, now, this is not the time for the immigration debate, and clearly I'm conflicted, because uh, I'm an immigrant. I have the privilege of living in this great country, and I have the privilege of being an Australian. Uh, uh, but when you look at the UK economy, uh, the, the economic figures released today were, were fascinating. Uh, the unemployment rate was down from 7.1 to 7.4 to 7.1. There were about 280,000 new jobs uh, created. Never in human history have uh, more people been at work in, in the UK. Now, partly that's a, a population increase, but the participation rate, which is key, obviously, is also significantly higher there. In part, Frankly, that's, there's a government there that has cut corporate taxes and encouraged uh, business formation, but it's also an influx of highly motivated uh, immigrants, many of them from continental Europe. And yet that, that country is conflicted by the de debate over the value of immigration. And it, it, of course, is not the only one, as we well know. But uh, those uh, uh, highly motivated migrants are, are raising the bar and creating opportunities for others. I mean, every government in the world, when you ask, is in favour of small business. Uh, some are a little sceptical when small business gets successful and becomes big business. But generally speaking, uh, uh, people try to take measures. But what is the difference between an, a government that knows, i.e. a knowledgeable government, about the role of business and a knowing government that actually creates opportunities and environment that is conducive to the creation of those businesses. And that's one of life's enduring little mysteries. I mean, one of, prior to going to Japan, 
Uh, I was a correspondent in Beijing for the Financial Times for, for almost four years. The economic reform policy was actually begun in late 1978. It was a meeting of the, the Chinese Communist Party. It, it really didn't take off until about 1986, 1987, because so many Chinese had the knowledge of past purges, the uh, Let 100 Flowers Bloom movement, which turned into uh, a terrible purge. It took people to ha a few years of genuine reform, a few years of watching, a few years of understanding to really know that they could go out and start a business. And that as a part of that and the reform and the autonomy that individuals gained through those reforms, you've seen the, the greatest uplift uh, in economic welfare anywhere in the world in human history. We can argue, is it 450 million people <coughs> lifted out of poverty, 500 million people lifted out of poverty, that's what you, you get, the eff efficaciousness of knowing, of people of a knowing government at that time, economically, if not politically, uh, and a people knowing about opportunity, that they would be rewarded, not punished for it. And again, back finally about media. What can media do to take advantage of these opportunities? In part, it's uh, disintermediating the disintermediators. Uh, and you look at U UGC, user generated content, and the, the U in UGC is often, um, frankly, uh, useless or sometimes ugly. Uh, and, but to have a knowledgeable society from which the knowingness comes, you have to have a well informed society. You do have to have professionally generated content. And frankly, Rupert uh, Murdoch is. Uh, at all of us, quite rightly, asking us to experiment uh, because he firmly believes in the importance of, of strong newspapers, of, of, of professional journalism, uh, of analysis, of, of a contest of ideas. Uh, and too, mu too many people in the media uh, have been uh, angst-ridden in their uh, arguments over uh, what to do to, to safeguard the role of professional content in society. But, but angst is no substitute for, for, for action. Uh, and so within the media itself, in providing information, providing the data that is a part of big data, uh, in informing, hopefully enlightening, uh, you have a platform for that knowledge. And so the knowledge economy is clearly important. Uh, but no country will realise its economic or its human potential unless it has a knowing economy. Thanks very much. Thank you, Robert. Um, John, bring it all back home. We've had Obamacare, Edward Snowden, epistemological differences between knowledge and knowing, and Dick Tracy watches. What ties all that together? Uh, well, let me try and tie it together with two ideas. One of those ideas uh, is um, innovation. Uh, and the other idea is education. So um, one of the things I think that Robert did very nicely is connect that somewhat esoteric concept of multi-factor productivity growth with the idea of incomes per household. How much money do people have in their pockets? How much money does a government have to provide all of the services that governments do provide? Uh, and essentially, as your productivity growth up goes up, you have more to spend. What makes productivity growth go up? By definition, it's about doing whatever I did yesterday somehow more efficiently, or doing something today a little bit better than I did it yesterday. And that is the essence of innovation. Uh, innovation, I think the nicest definition of it is simply good ideas successfully applied. So when we talk about economic growth, almost by definition, what we are talking about is somehow doing whatever we did yesterday better than we did it, uh, sorry, better, so whatever we did yesterday, doing it slightly better today. Now, the interesting thing about this, um, if you ask about a, a, an economy, uh, is that in fact, most of those things that we do, that we buy, that we consume, all the rest of it, are in fact produced inside our own country. So in Australia, something like 84% of what we consume is produced in Australia. We've had an entire day dedicated to trade and international affairs. Unfortunately, the big game in terms of economic productivity is fundamentally a domestic game. And that number is about the same for the United States. More than 80% of what United, of Americans consume 
is produced in America. Uh, and of course, what that means is that if you want to see your economy grow, if you want to see people better off, uh, it's fundamentally about what you do in your own country. Now, lots of things can contribute to that. Um, everything from uh, the, the, your infrastructure, as, as Robert was talking, your competition policy, opening up your economy, all of those things contribute. But fundamentally, it comes down to what is it that is encouraging people to do something better than they did it yesterday? Now, the other big problem in discussions about innovation and knowledge economy is everyone assumes that what you have to do to get economic growth is invent something. It's not true. What you have to do is do something better than you did it yesterday. Uh, and if you use your eyes and plagiarise uh, and copy that idea from someone else, in fact, by and large, everyone is in fact better off. That's why this issue of intellectual property restriction is such a big deal, because if you restrict the free flow of ideas, you are ultimately restricting the spread of innovation. And whilst there may be justifications for intellectual property protection, you need to understand the cost of it is quite material. So that's why I raised that question earlier. But of course, the other thing that makes an even bigger difference to this, and I think it's really interesting that in four speakers we haven't mentioned this, is what is the capacity of your workforce to either come up with those ideas, or much more importantly, look at them from elsewhere and successfully adopt them? Because successfully adopting ideas is actually not as easy as it sounds. Uh, and certainly, if you look at the work that people like Hanashik and Wolfman have been doing over the last couple of years, indeed a number of economists, in the very long run, the thing that will make the most difference to an innovation economy, the most difference to a knowledge economy, is simply put, the education level of your population. To what extent do you have a population that is well-educated and good at adopting ideas and applying them? And bear in mind, when we're talking about applying them, yes, of course, whatever you're doing in, in the cutting edge of, of IT or whatever is important, but look at a national economy. Most of it is about construction, it's about health, it's about financial services, it's about electricity. None of this is terribly glamorous, none of it sounds like a knowledge economy, but that is where most of the work in any economy is done, and therefore that's where the innovation matters, and that's where the education level of that workforce is absolutely crucial. Now this, I think, is where the really, really difficult problem comes, and this is where I think in a, in a discussion between uh, alliance partners, uh, between two incredibly good friends such as United States and Australia, uh, we are entitled, as I hope, as a really good friend, to start talking about the things that other people don't want to talk about. The bottom line is that the American education system is in deep, deep trouble. Uh, if you look at adult literacy, so that looks across the population, the sort of work that the OECD has been doing. Uh, Australia does okay, we're about kind of top quartile. In, um, uh, the United States, on the other hand, is very much third quartile. If you look at tertiary completion rates uh, in the United States, uh, it was the highest, so if you look at people between the ages of 55 and 64, uh, no country in the world has as high a completion rate as the United States. I remember when my very first job working for David Pennington, the Vice Chancellor at the University of Melbourne on education policy 25 years ago, we talked about the mass education system in the United States, Australia's very elite higher education system, and never imagined that that would change. Today there are more people aged 25 to 34 in Australia who have finished university or college than there are in the United States. So completion rates in the United States for higher education have fallen to be, nowadays, more or less middle of the OECD from the point that they were 30 years ago, very clearly top of the OECD. And then if we look at school education, uh, uh, overall uh, the United States is very much third quartile. The thing that matters most is numeracy education. Not surprisingly, the ability of your workforce to analyse things is fundamentally about their ability these days to manipulate numbers and data. It's a really important skill. If you have people who are fundamentally numerically non-numeric, they just can't do that stuff. And that is the place where the United States is doing the worst. I know, you know, Australia is also doing the worst, but the United States is doing particularly badly uh, in the bottom quartile. Uh, and um, uh, again, we have, and in the United States, worse still, you have a real geographic divide. You have some places like Massachusetts and Connecticut, which are doing about as well as Australia. They're not doing as well as Shanghai, 
uh, as um, uh, Finland, as Korea and so on, but at least they're doing respectably. But there are a significant number of states in the United States which are essentially about the same level as Greece. Uh, that is not a good news story. Uh, and we know, unfortunately, that it doesn't matter how much technology you throw at your schools, it doesn't actually make a lot of difference. What makes a really big difference is to what extent are the teachers getting good performance feedback from other teachers uh, and good performance feedback from their principals, uh, and to what extent are they well trained in the first place, and to what extent do, the, do, do some of your brightest and best go into school education. And in both Australia and the United States, we are struggling on all three of those fronts. So what I'd just like to leave you with is that, yes, our broadband infrastructure matters. Yes, all of these changes in the knowledge economy matters. But the knowledge economy, more than anything else, is about education. Uh, in Australia, we are doing, I would suggest, OK, but not brilliantly. And the United States, I would suggest, has long term a very, very real problem. Uh, and if the history, economic history of the world of the last 40 or 50 years turns out to also be true of the economic history of the next 40 or 50 years, uh, unless there is a sea change in the United States, uh, particularly school and also uh, college education, it strikes me that it is likely that we will see the continue, as we'll, we'll see a decline in US economic performance relative to the rest of the world. And it's interesting that the countries that we are talking about the most in Asia, we've spent a lot of time talking about in Asia, uh, Korea has, pro South Korea has probably successfully managed to get to the point of too much tertiary education. I think it's the only country in the world that's ever succeeded in doing that. Uh, the education results out of Shanghai and Beijing can only be described as spectacular. People say to me, that's only Shanghai, to which my answer is, that's 15 million people, that's quite a lot. And my guess is that the rest of the Chinese education system will, will basically follow it. The one thing that China is very good at is experimenting, finding a way, a good, doing, good way of doing something and rolling it out. So in a knowledge economy, can I suggest we need to worry a lot about education. Uh, and that's something on which I suspect both Australia and the United States have something to learn from each other and then perhaps even more to learn from the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I think the Wall Street Journal has recently reported that there were more patent applications in 2013 coming out of Shenzhen than out of uh, Silicon Valley. Um, I think we started five minutes late. According to me, we, that means we've got about 15 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, lots of food for thought on the table. Who would like to address a question to the panel or to a specific panelist? Yes, sir. We got a mic. Mics are still here. Great. Right, seeing no one else was putting their hand up, I'll jump in again. It's John Keogh from the Australian Financial Review. Uh, Jason, just a little bit off topic, but related to the discussion. I'm interested in your no sort scoops of here. big picture view on the outlook for the American economy this year. Is this the, the year? You get as many scoops as you can. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm here for, Malcolm. Uh, Jason, the outlook for the American economy this year, is this the year that it's finally going to take off? Uh, what do you see as the headwinds or opportunities for the American economy this year? Uh, I'm sure, sure I'm happy to answer that. And I did a, a two-sentence version of that. I was talking more about the medium and long-term structural trends before. But in terms of the cyclical out, outlook, I think the most favorable things for the United States in 2014 are number one, that we'll have less fiscal drag. In 2013, we had to contend with the expiration of the payroll tax cut, with the sequester coming into effect. All told, um, the deficit contracted by 2.7% of GDP. The Congressional Budget Office estimated that the sequester subtracted 750,000 jobs and took 0.6 percentage point off our growth rate. Going into 2014, we're going to continue to see our deficit decline, but decline much more gradually. You're not going to have any rounds of large fiscal restraint of the type we've seen. And in fact, with the budget deal we've gotten at the end of last year, we have been able to buy back a substantial portion of the sequester and put us in a better place to invest and grow. Second, I'd say housing. We still have significant potential. We're building about a million houses a year. The steady state needs for the country, just based on new household formation and depreciation, is about 1.6 million houses. And over the course of the next couple of years, we'll probably bridge that gap. So that's been a strong um, 
component of American growth for the next couple of years, and it continues to have um, potential. And then finally, you've seen um, a long, painful process of deleveraging coming out of a very deep recession. Um, we're gone a lot of the way through that process in terms of consumers um, reducing their debt, reducing their interest payments, and being um, in a better position to spend. There's no doubt um, with all of that that there's a really long way to go still. There's no doubt that there's a lot of challenges we still face. It's important that, for example, we continue on the momentum of budget stability and not do something like um, mess up around the debt limit and the Congress does its job there. It's important that we'd see continued stability um, and financial improvement in the rest of the world in places like Europe. Um, but if we do all of that, I do think the Ameri uh, United States has a very strong private sector that's, that's really ready to grow. Sorry, Robert, just one, one very quick question from one Essendon supporter to another. And given the disruption that Malcolm's been talking about from technology in your industry, uh, could you ever envisage News Corporation trying to merge or buy a free aware network in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that's the difference between knowledge and knowing. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, the, well responded. Another question: Who's got who's got a mic? We've got lots of hands. How many mics do we have? With the woman in the in the second table back there, could could you get her a mic, please? Beverly Lindsay, Visiting Professor, Institute of Education, University of London, and Professor Penn State. My question or comment is directed to Mr. Daly. One, uh, there's a lot of different ways to interpret the OEC data, the PISA data, and one of the main factors that certainly is overlooked are the socio-cultural components of education and what's encouraged in the countries. But the, real, the question I have is the following. And for you first, but perhaps the other gentlemen as well, that is, how do you envision education improving through various forms of technology and platforms such as MOOCs? Uh, thank you. Um, uh, firstly, obviously, the OECD does its best to correct for cultural, socio-cultural factors. Secondly, I would have thought if there was any country that was actually going to do well out of those socio-cultural factors, it would be the United States. Thirdly, it's... Uh, it's tough to think of two countries that are socio-culturally more like each other than Australia and the United States, except maybe Canada, uh, maybe New Zealand, um, and yet we're seeing very, very different results. I think it is high time that the United States looked at the numbers and said, these are not good numbers and we have a major problem. The other thing I would add is that if you look at the mm -hmm. history of those economic growth numbers, the sorts of things that Hanasek and, and, and Vosman have been looking at, Whatever it is that PISA is measuring, that is the precise thing that is correlating with economic growth, because that's effectively what they've been using. So whatever it's measuring, it appears to matter. Uh, and therefore, if you're not doing well on that stuff, it does, I would suggest, give you cause for concern. Uh, in terms of technology, um, uh, as I said, certainly historically, technology doesn't appear to have been a major driver of improvement in school education outcomes. Uh, that's not surprising. I think if you think back to your own school education, the thing that matters most is the extent to which you sit there, you work it out, you think about it, uh, and then you are helped by a teacher. Uh, and getting computing systems to the point where they can really do that is quite difficult, although they're getting closer. In terms of higher education, we're obviously seeing a substantial shift. Um, I suspect that what we are probably seeing is the death of the lecture, but not the tutorial. If I can kind of, you know simplify uh, overly uh, higher education, there's a part of it which is about knowledge absorption, roughly speaking, reading the textbook uh, or listening to the lecture, which certainly in my experience tended to be more or less substitutes for each other. And then there's a second game, which is essentially as a student talking about that material with other people, interrogating it, being forced to ask a question, being forced to answer a question, essentially that human activity of thinking it through for yourself and having to articulate it. Um, it's possible to do that online, but a great deal harder. 
Uh, and it's possible to mass produce that, but much, much harder. And I think that's the part of higher education that won't be enormously affected by the growth of online. The lecture, on the other hand, strikes me as being in deep trouble. As Alan Gingell was pointing out the other day, you know, if you want to learn about early medieval history, you know, why would you bother going to your local university? Why wouldn't you just pull down the material off, off Yale where, you know, the best in the world basically does his thing um, and be done with it? Um, so it's a bit of a winner-takes-all game in terms of providing that part of the material. But as I suggested, that what you might loosely describe as the tutorial experience uh, strikes me as an extraordinarily important part of higher education. That's where we really learn to argue, to analyse, to think, to question. Um, and that's the part that I don't think will be replaced by MOOCs. And indeed, if you look at MOOC completion, overwhelmingly, more or less, the only people who complete these courses are people who have already been through that kind of tertiary education experience and have learnt those kind of skills already. Thank you. Um, as Tom Friedman says, it's not what you know that counts, it's what you do with what you know that counts. Let's hope there's a role for universities. Uh, to this side of the table. Lucy, wait for a mic. <laughs> If you're going to transform the way teachers are rewarded for exceptional performance, you're going to run into some, you know, so I would have thought in the US as well as in Australia, some institutional blockages where the default setting is to reward seniority and not performance. So how do you go about a cultural transformation of educational systems in both countries to achieve a performance culture? Mm. Look, I think that's could we get could we get Robert in on this one? Because I know that I mean certainly at least your boss Robert has been way into this topic in in New York and his work with the former commissioner of schools in New York. Exactly, Our Amplify is part of uh, News Corporation, which is uh, really starting from a greenfield site, trying to create a digital curriculum, uh, which is uh, dealing with in part. I mean, obviously, trying to enhance the education of every student in the U.S. initially, but also dealing with the terrible contradiction that we have kids who are digitally literate and functionally illiterate. Uh, but the curriculum alone is not enough, and, and actually Amplify uh, uh, is working with teachers uh, to help them understand how they can use... It's not a replacement for teachers at all. Um, the, the role of the teacher is a crucial one. Uh, and, uh, but the, the, the culture around the teachers where um, the best teachers are not necessarily rewarded or promoted or encouraged financially at least, or in some cases, uh, in some cities culturally, uh, in the way that's appropriate for the children. And so, get, so rem removing that disconnect, that's, that's not our job, but providing the teachers uh, with the best possible contemporary uh, curriculum certainly is our job. And, and Rupert and Joel have put a lot of money, Joel Klein, uh, a lot of money uh, and effort uh, in, into realising that goal. Malcolm Turnbull wanted to jump in. Yeah, I'll just make one, one observation that a, a very a common problem uh, in Australia and the United States is the uh, uh, relative shortage of uh, students completing courses in STEM subjects, so science, technology, engineering, mathematics, etc., uh, at university. And this is extra this is, a, is really a market failure because there are so many jobs available in those areas. And as uh, John mentioned earlier, there is really no area of endeavour anywhere that does not require you to have a certain level of uh, quantitative analytical skills. Now, one of the uh, causes of this, so it is said, is a lack of uh, training in subjects like mathematics and science and, of course, computing science, more applied subject, in the K-12 system. Uh, one of the challenges there, of course, is uh, a, a teacher who can uh, teach effectively in a technical subject, in mathematics, for example, and do so in a charismatic and engaging way has skills that are extremely marketable, not least in, in my old line of business and banking. Um, so we, 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 have a, we have a very serious problem there in both countries, and this is something that, uh, that has to be addressed. It is not going to be solved by MOOCs uh, alone, although I'm a great fan of them. Uh, and uh, rewarding, rewarding and incentivising uh, and improving the remuneration of the most talented teachers 
uh, particularly in these areas of greatest demand, is critical. If I may just add one final footnote to that, uh, as uh, Cheryl Sandberg was, was pointing out uh, to me last week, the, the remarkable thing about this problem is that the percentage of women doing computing science courses has actually halved, according to her, over the last 25 years or so. Uh, that's another big topic, but you know, if we have got a shortage of people with these skills, one way to resolve that is to actually tap into that half of the population that are women. Thank you. Um, if we to keep to about a five past four stop time, perhaps we could have two very short questions and equally brief responses, bang, bang, uh, in the left-hand corner as I see it. Okay, so just very quickly, we've talked a lot about the platform. I'm just interested, do you think, or does anyone on the panel think that there's a, there's a possibility and, and whether it matters that with all of this information available, do we can actually, we start to stop communicating with each other? That is, we can always instantly find that information that fits with our, our view of the world and read it and feel happy and never have to talk to someone who disagrees with that. Internet promotes the end of dialogue. Anyone want to respond to that? I was going to ask Siri what it has to say. But, no. um, can, I, I, can I make a political observation? Uh, uh, a lot of um, congressmen and senators have said to me over the years in, this, you know, for in Washington and outside of Washington that the proliferation of media outlets occasioned first by the development of cable television and now, of course, by the rise of the internet, the Uber platform on which there's, you know, potentially a, almost an infinite number of channels of communication, means that fewer and fewer people are into broadcasting and more and more people are into narrowcasting. And so that instead of Walter Cronkite bowling the news more or less up the middle, uh, you can find a news channel that conforms to your own prejudices and so people aren't, people aren't listening to the same message. That is a, that's a, that I think that is a, a real issue. There are some big issues we haven't had time to touch on about the erosion of the great foundations of mass journalism. I mean, it's important to remember that the reason big newspapers tended to play it down the middle, you know, the Sydney Morning Herald, I think quoting Alexander Pope, was it, the despising something, something, I'm neither Whig nor Tory in moderation, placing all my glory. The reason was that was not because the owners were centrist, but because they wanted to get the widest range of readers and hence the maximum advertising revenue. Uh, but if you can make money narrow casting, then you will do that. I think that does pose very, very, very real issues. It's one of the reasons why in our system, the, our public broadcasters, the ABC and SBS, for which I'm responsible in a, you know, in a, you know, parliamentary way, in a ministerial way, um, I'm not, I don't program them, obviously, uh, but why it is so important, absolutely critical, that they are completely objective and fair and balanced. So Robert's newspapers can be partisan, left, right, whatever way they like, that's entirely up to them. But the public broadcasters have to play it right down the middle, and that, I think, is, is actually becoming more important than ever as the rest of the media tends to be able to narrowcast. Last question. If I could Who just make like one to... point. Sorry, oh, sorry okay. to be brutal. Um, but there's also You're not going to have a shot at PBS, are you, Robert? No, I'm not. And oh, I'm going okay. to a completely related but separate point, which is the distinction between <laughs> origination and distribution of content. I mean, Facebook has a news stream. Facebook doesn't have any journalists. They aggregate other people's news. And so one of the, to Malcolm's point, in the old days, you created news and around it, you sold advertising. Um, now there's a content kleptocracy which takes other people's content, repurposes it and generates revenue from it. And that's the fundamental content contradiction that hasn't quite been resolved commercially. It's our, our responsibility, certainly the properties I'm responsible for, I'm responsible for. But I think it, more broadly as a society, there hasn't been enough debate about that revenue disconnect. And it's the, it's the same at Google, it's the same at Facebook, uh, the same at Yahoo now with uh, Sumly, which is summarising uh, other people's news, the, the new app they have. And it's quite interesting. You look at the bottom, it says something like summarised by Sumly. It doesn't tell you uh, wh where that story originated. 
Okay, now the last question. Short one, anyone got anything burning they want to ask? Second table there, the gentleman with the beard. Uh, kind of really is the last question for anybody on the panel who wants to take it. Um, you know, this Uber platform, the internet has made it much more efficient and productive to deliver lots of content. Great when that helps you deliver education much more efficiently and, and quickly. Not so great maybe when it comes to the productivity increases for you if you are recruiting terrorists, if you are trading child pornography, um, you know, the list goes on of unacceptable things. Question is, do you think that the current public policy and legal frameworks they have derived mainly from other platforms uh, are adequate today to deal with these issues? Or do we need to, to really look at some new approaches to how we deal with stifling the efficient delivery of these undesirable pieces of content at the same time we don't stifle innovation and, and more desirable content going Malcolm, across? Malcolm, you have, you have direct responsibility, don't you, for this area? How do you balance it? Well, I'm the minister. I'm the Minister for Communications, not for the Minister for Stifling Communications. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm very much in the free speech department uh, and I um, view calls to um, censor the internet or limit the internet with enormous scepticism and, and trepidation. So, yep, there's a lot of nasty stuff online, there sure is, and a lot of it's in breach of the law and a lot of it, regrettably, is beyond the reach of the law because it's in jurisdictions, you know, outside of the United States uh, or Australia for that matter. Um, having said that, it is a powerful force for freedom. Um, I, I'll make, let me make a couple of observations and I'm not, tr I mean, first, just, I just should note that we have a very rigorous policy on child safety uh, and, you know, we've been having a little bit of a tussle with some of the social media platforms about how quickly they should take stuff down that is causing harm to children. Uh, I think all of us, even the f most ardent free speech advocates, uh, draw a, a very strong line in the sand there. But uh, let, me just, uh, let me just make this, this observation. Every new medium has been used for bad stuff. You know, when the printing press was invented, I've got no doubt there were people that were saying, do you know, this won't just be used to print Bibles, it'll be used to print pornography and politi you know, seditious political material and so forth. And so every, every medium, every platform can be used by, for good purposes and, and not so good purposes and boring purposes and also very bad purposes. But you know, freedom has to be our absolute talisman. And we, you, know, that's, you guys have got a very strong First Amendment culture uh, we don't have a First Amendment written in those terms, but uh, we, our values don't uh, differ from yours very much at all. Um, I, I do think uh, the issue of child protection is a very significant one. Um, as I said, the, uh, I think one of the most effective ways of dealing with it is, is when people realise that, contrary to the famous New Yorker cartoon of 93 or 4, you know, which has one dog on a computer and the other on the floor and the dog at the computer says on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Well, the reality is nowadays, not only does everybody know you're a dog, they know what breed of dog you are, they know how many fleas there are on your tail, they know where you live, they know who your doggy friends are, and they know what you've been looking at on the internet. And one of the most effective ways to deal with a lot of this, this very, un, you know, very unsavoury and criminal material is actually good old-fashioned policing. Catching these people, arresting them, you know, uh, prosecuting them, convicting them and sending them to jail. It's very, very tough work for the police, I might say. You know, going, chasing all that stuff up, it's some of the un, most unpleasant work, but it is very important. So the law, the internet is not beyond the law. Some of the people are beyond the reach of the law, but those people who break the law within our jurisdictions, we should pursue uh, vigorously, but at the same time, recognising that speech, you know, as long as it is not abusing children or advocating terrorism or, you know, breaching very well understood and, and legitimate restrictions on speech, as long as it's not doing that, 
we should uh, really celebrate the freedom uh, that this uh, extraordinary global platform is giving not just us, but many people who've never had a voice or access to knowledge and uh, engagement uh, before. Can I just say something a little, as someone who runs a broadcasting company in Australia or has one reporting to him, um, uh, something a little harsher than, than Malcolm said. I think a lot of these video aggregators frankly use freedom of speech as, <coughs> as a cover for blatant uh, allowance of piracy uh, when the video aggregators, if they really uh, put as much effort into protecting children, um, protecting intellectual property, protecting copyright as they d did do into um, devising new ways of making revenue from video, uh, then there would be a, a, a lot less disturbing material uh, on the web uh, and there would be uh, a lot more recognition of, of property rights. Uh, it, it's not that difficult to do. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, we often think, and I think today started with the, the normal understanding of an alliance. Uh, it's about national security. It's about cooperation out there in the international system. I think what this panel has uh, driven home to me is the fact that sharing perspectives uh, among friends, trusted friends, is also an incredibly important part of the Australia-US relationship. Please join me in thanking our panelists for doing so, so eloquently this afternoon. <laughs> Should we de-stage first, Bates, or do you want to? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we just have a few more minutes uh, remaining. We wanted to have a few closing words. We've asked uh, former ambassador to Australia, uh, Jeffrey Bleich, who served as uh, our ambassador in Australia from 2009 to 2013, just recently uh, returned to California from his post in Canberra. We've asked him to make a few uh, summary remarks, uh, and then uh, we'll have a, a, a few closing words from the direct, one of the co-directors of the Alliance 21 program, uh, Robert Hill. Jeff. Well, thank you, Bates, and um, I, I saw a number of you starting to gather up your materials. I was one of those, so I will, I will keep this brief. Um, but I, I do want to thank the organizers and all the participants. I think it was really an outstanding program today. And I also want to thank all the people in the room, many of whom are the people who are, who are continuing building this extraordinary relationship. Um, one person that I'd like to single out is not here right now, but who I think kind of exemplifies what's strong about the relationship is uh, Ambassador Beasley, who has uh, now uh, served under four prime ministers in uh, four years. So that has to be some sort of uh, record for, for Australians, but it, it goes to show a point that we always talk about, which is that it doesn't matter which political party is in power in Canberra or in DC, it doesn't matter which personality is at the head of any particular party, we make progress together and we grow together as an alliance, and, and, and Kim and his outstanding work for our alliance, I think, is a, is a demonstration of that. Um, when you leave a job like this, uh, there are a couple questions that you, that you frequently get. You know, one of them is, you know, are you going to press the elevator button or just keep standing there? Um, because uh, <laughs> to relearn basic skills. Um, but another one that you're often asked is, what are you most proud of? Um, and uh, I have said this before in Australia, but you know, if I, if I could reduce uh, uh, the time that I served in Australia down to one, one thing, uh, then I would have failed as an ambassador and I would have failed our relationship. Uh, because the strength of the alliance is that it's like a marriage. And no one says, you know, so what was the, what was the best thing you did in your marriage this past year? Uh, if you can answer that question, uh, there's probably a, a, a problem. Um, it's the hundreds of things that you do together, big and small, uh, where you look after each other that, that um, uh, give me the greatest pride. And um, marriages are what get you through times. You know, children get older, they suddenly become teenagers, you got, you know, jobs change, houses change, I'm going through all that right now. And the, uh, and the, the Interesting thing is, you know, how do you make it through? By looking to people whose values you trust, who have a common purpose with you, uh, who are devoted to one another, and, uh, and, and who you know can make it through anything. You'll be resilient together. Uh, 
And that's what I think we picked up from today's uh, discussion. When you look at where we were four years ago, there was real anxiety about the um, uh, uh, America's role in the Pacific. And we heard some of that. The choices that were put up and we had to click on at the beginning, um, you know, uh, would the U.S. having uh, been exhausted by the conflict in Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, having global financial crisis, would we be too depleted and too distracted to be engaged in this region as we needed to be? Those are the questions that we faced. And what we did, if you look at the, uh, the results of that, you know, that, that time, what we've done in the last four years, is we doubled down. We re-engaged uh, in our alliance. We invested in the partners, and we invested in a belief that we would muddle through this together and we'd come out stronger. So, um, four years ago, uh, we um, made a number of uh, major commitments, and I'll just go through those because they reflect what was said at the panel. First, um, trade relationships to bind us together. Uh, the free trade agreement went into force five years ago uh, over great skepticism and criticism and, uh, and, and instead, as we heard from all the panelists, turned out much better than anyone expected, even with the global financial crisis. Tremendous growth in our trade relationship and our investment and, uh, and trade have, been, uh, have hit record highs. In terms of expanding free trade, we both, again, over great skepticism within our countries, um, made free trade agreements with Korea. And then the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is the mother of all victims of skepticism. I remember when we first moved into it, people said, oh, this sounds like a nice coalition of the willing. Uh, the two of you with Brunei and, and Malaysia and Peru and Chile, not to denigrate those countries, but not the, the tremendous economic powerhouses of the world. And where are we today? We are, we are on the cusp of closing out that agreement and it's already 40% of the world's GDP if you add Korea to it. It's going to be one of the um, most significant trade agreements in all of, in, in, in all of world history, uh, tying together this region. So that's what we did together in the last four years. What did we do together on, um, uh, on diplomacy? Four years ago, people were talking about it's alphabet soup out there, lots of different um, uh, uh, entities that are trying to be the architecture for the region, none of which covers all the areas that it should. And look where we went. We have uh, U.S. signed the Treaty of Amity, uh, joined ASEAN, the East Asia Summit. We were at the leaders level. We joined the, joined the IOR ARC. We reinvigorated EPEC. I won't go through all the things, but we are deeply embedded in the architecture of uh, the Asia Pacific. And then finally, security wise, there was a sense that we were going to retreat from the region. Instead, the president stood in the well of parliament and said, We are doubling down on our commitment to this region. And you see it in a uh, hundred different ways. It's not just Marines up in Darwin got everyone so excited. It's the fact that we added cyber to our treaty, our alliance treaty. We focused on the issues that are the real threats, whether it's, you know, um, uh, satellite collisions in near space, or whether it is cyber attacks, whether it is um, uh, natural resource challenges. So um, that's what we did in four years. And so I listened to the problems that were addressed today, and I think those are serious problems. The real issues that we face today uh, that were mentioned, resource constraints in Asia, uh, not only um, cyber attacks, but insider threats and the, um, and, and the theft of cyber material and all the ways that it can disrupt our economies. Um, the talk about not just nation states and natural competition that we expect among rising powers, but also the networks of uh, criminals that, uh, that, that are working the other challenges in terms of rule of law. And finally, how we as two countries that are the largest and the 12th largest economies in the world maintain our advantage, whether it's in innovation or in uh, some of the other spaces that were discussed. How do we do that um, as the world continues to shift under our feet? I think the answer is uh, in the next four years is the same answer we've had for the last four years by just strapping our arms together even closer and recognizing that two great nations uh, with a common purpose and a tremendous devotion to one another can pretty much do anything. So thank you very much.
Well, Bates has had to run off for a media engagement, so on his behalf, firstly, thank you, Jeff. You are um, not only a great advocate for your country in Australia, but you have proven to be a great advocate for our special relationship, and the fact that you're still willing to pursue that is something we very much appreciate. Um, my job is to, um, is, is to thank everyone. Can I start with um, CSIS for hosting us here today and for the, uh, the efforts they put into making the arrangements? Uh, can I thank um, uh, all of our sponsors, again, without which this, uh, this would not be possible? Um, the Australian government, yes, but particularly I'm referring to the corporate, corporate sponsors. Uh, we thank the G'day team, the consulate in LA and, and, uh, and others who have, um, uh, from the Australian government perspective, helped this event. Uh, I want to thank um, everyone that uh, participated today, particularly those who've come from afar, but also the DC audience that's been prepared to come in and not only listen, but also, uh, also participate. This, um, this program is, uh, as you would have realised during the day, uh, it's about the alliance, but it's really about the, um, the shared values, the common interests that under, under uh, uh, line the alliance, license, the alliance, the foundations for the alliance. And we've been of a view that uh, there needs to be more focus on, on that because the value of the shared relationship and, the, and, what, we, and what, we, what we have in common is what, in effect, sustains a legal document. And uh, we think that effort has been worthwhile, and we think that today's uh, uh, discussions have uh, reinforced our view. Uh, we're planning to take it forward, as was mentioned by Bates, at a, at a further event, in effect, the flip side event to this one in Canberra on June the 18th of this year. Uh, and we're hopeful that we'll get a strong contingent from uh, the United States to hear similar subjects and participate in debate on similar subjects, but with the Australian um, bias rather than the United States bias. So I look forward to seeing many of you in Canberra in June. Um, unfortunately, it will be cold, but not quite as uh, cold as here. Uh, to finish the day in good spirit, uh, Melissa tells me that we're hosting a reception out there where you can look at the snow and um, perhaps have a glass of uh, good Australian wine. Uh, and with that, uh, I, I close today's um, uh, conference. And once again, thank you all for participating.